In this lesson, we're going to talk about derivatives of higher order and what that means. Here I have a function s of t is equal to 2t squared minus 3t minus 2, and it's represented by this graph. If we want to find the derivative of this function, we would say s prime of t is equal to, and the answer is 4t minus 3. And that's it. Now, since we took the derivative once, you could actually call this the first derivative. So first derivative. I'm adding this language of first because you can actually do this again. You can take the derivative of the derivative and the term that we give that, we'd call that the second derivative. And the notation that I'll use for this is well, since we're going to take the derivative of the first derivative, I'll mark this with an s double prime of t. And this notation means we've taken a derivative twice, starting from this function here. Uh, the answer is pretty simple. We would get 4, and that's it. So if you want the second derivative of a function, you would first take the first derivative, and then you would take the derivative one more time. You could keep going. There's a third, fourth, fifth derivative, and so on. But if we took the derivative of this function, the third derivative would just be 0. It would be 0 thereafter. So I'll just end the process here. I would also like to discuss why you would want to consider a derivative of a higher order, like a second derivative, for example. To explain this, I'm going to give this formula a little bit of context. So s of t, let's say that it um, told you the distance that a particle was traveling on a line. So like this thing measures uh, distance, we'll say. And we'll say that it is in meters um, after, and we'll say time t in seconds. So you know, if you want to know how far this particle has traveled after three seconds, you'd put three into this formula, and the output would tell you how far it moved. Well, the derivative, as we have discussed, of this function is the velocity. It tells you how fast your particle is traveling. And the reason for this is the units are going to be meters per second. A derivative is a slope. That means the units are going to be a fraction. Meters will be on top. The time unit of seconds will be in the denominator. So taking the derivative tells you the velocity of this object. So it tells you something meaningful about what is happening. What would it mean to take the derivative again? So here, if you look at the second derivative, that means you're taking the derivative of the velocity function. You know, what, what is this? To think about what this means, I'll think about the units on what this new function is gonna be. The units are going to be meters per second per second. So every time that you take a derivative, you're putting another per second into the question. So I kind of look at it as the units are meters per second per second. And the seconds between these two denominators can actually be combined together. And I'll just write the units as meters per second squared. So each time you take a derivative, it puts the unit of seconds into the denominator. So if you do it a second time, you get seconds being multiplied together into the denominator, which is why the exponent is 2. What is this? Meters per second squared. This has a name, and this is acceleration. It tells you how your velocity is changing. And so I'll use a of t to represent Okay, well, A stands for acceleration. If you know the position, a function, for some particle that is traveling, the first derivative is going to be the velocity, and the second derivative is going to be the acceleration of that particle. In example one, I would just like to get some practice of taking a second derivative of a given function. So let's try that here with this function f of x. If you want the second derivative, you must first find the first derivative. So here it's going to be cosine of x plus 9x to the 8th plus 1. If we want the second derivative, 
we just take the derivative of the first derivative. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. The derivative of 9x to the power of 8 is going to be 72x to the 7th. The derivative of 1 is 0. And this is our answer. What about the derivative of what I'm calling g of z, where z is the variable, and in my equation, I'm taking z and multiplying it by e to the z, a product of two functions. If we want the second derivative, well, we need the first derivative first. Uh, the product rule says that we get 1 times e to the z. That's the derivative of the first times the second. We then add on, leave the first alone, and multiply by the derivative of the second, which is this. So here is our first derivative. I'll write it as e to the z plus z times e to the z. Now, if I want to take the derivative of this thing, okay, so that'll be my second derivative. I'm going to use this as my starting point and just work through by differentiating it. Starting with this e to the z, well, the derivative of e to the z is e to the z. Great. And then we add on the derivative of z times e to the z, which actually is this thing right here. I mean, I'll do the workout for it again, but we'd have to use the product rule. z is being multiplied by e to the z. Therefore, we get 1 times e to the z plus z times e to the z. I think it's worth simplifying this thing here. Okay, this is going to be, you know, e to the z plus, well, that's really just e to the z plus z times e to the z. Or maybe more simply, we have two e to the z's, and then we have z times e to the z. So this would be the final answer. If you want to think ahead with this problem, this wasn't asked, but you could ask about, hey, what's the third derivative? You know, what's the, what's the fourth derivative? You could put four marks, but maybe I'll just like, in fact, I think a better way to write this would be in the exponent, I'll just put like a four to indicate that I'm taking the fourth derivative. Um, I'm seeing that if I took the second derivative, I ended up with the same function, but I got two e to the z. You know, I'm wondering, I'm not proving this, but you know, I'm wondering if, well, if I do it again, will I get three e to the z plus z e to the z? Or if I did it four times, would I get 4e to the z plus z e to the z? And could you generalize this to, well, if I did the nth derivative, would I get n e to the z plus z e to the z? Something to think about if you'd like to. But really for this problem, I have a second derivative, and it's this thing here. You can also find a second derivative if you have an implicitly defined function. And the way to do it is to use that process twice in a given equation. Let's try that out here. So if you want the second derivative, you first need the first derivative. So if I differentiate both sides of this with respect to x, I get 1 plus, OK, I've come across a product of two functions. So the derivative is going to be 5 times y plus 5x times y prime. And this is equal to negative 2x. So here we go. We have the first derivative. But really, what I want to figure out is, well, what is the second derivative? And what I'll do is differentiate this equation one more time. Before I do that, I'm actually going to, off to the side, solve for y prime. I think that might be useful when we move on in this process. If I solve for y prime, I'm going to subtract 5y and 1 to this other side of the equation and divide by 5x. It's pretty quick to write out what this is equal to. So I have negative 2x on the right. I'll subtract the 5y and the 1 from both sides. And then we have that 5x that's attached to the y prime. So this is what y prime is equal to, this thing here. But I digress. I want to go back to this equation and somehow use it to find y double prime. I'm just going to go through one more time 
and take the derivative yet again. So on the left, I see I have a one here, the derivative is going to be zero, but then I get to five y. The derivative of five y is five y prime. Okay, I then add on, now I'm, I'm taking the derivative of this part again, and it's a product, so I need to use the product rule. The product rule says take the derivative of the first and multiply it by the second, which gives you y prime again. And then you add on the first being left alone times the derivative of the second. But the derivative of the derivative is exactly the thing that we're trying to solve for. So that's y double prime. This is equal to, and on the other side, you get negative 2. So here, well, this is going to be the second derivative. So let's solve for it. Let's solve for y double prime. What I'll do is subtract, well, actually, I can combine these together. Let me do that. Uh, first, I'm seeing we get 10y prime plus 5x times y double prime is equal to negative 2. I'm going to subtract this to the other side and divide both sides by 5x. When I do that, I get that y double prime is equal to, the negative 2 was already there, I'm subtracting y prime, 10y prime from both sides, and I'm dividing by 5x. For answers of implicitly defined functions, if you're finding the first or second derivative, it's nice to have no derivatives over here in your equation, you know, just x's and y's and numbers. Well, I solved for y prime earlier because I can just like directly plug this in. I'll leave it as something unsimplified, but it will be our answer. You get negative 2 minus 10 times y prime. y prime itself is equal to negative 2x minus 5y minus 1 all over 5x. And that whole thing is also divided by 5x. Definitely a mess of an answer. You know, but you could, let's say, multiply the top and bottom by 5x to cancel this denominator, distribute that negative 10, maybe combine some like terms. But really for this process, I just wanted to get to a formula for the second derivative that only depended on x's and y's, and that is precisely what I have over here. All right, let's try a problem with some context to it. So for this question, we're going to have a particle. We'll say this particle is moving on a line, and maybe this is its starting point. Its distance from the starting point is represented by this function, and I have a graph of it down here. So s of t tells you how far the particle is in meters at some time in t seconds. So before like reading the rest of the problem, I want to draw a picture of like what I'm thinking about, what's happening for the particle. Here's our starting point, and the particle is moving further and further away until it gets to here, and it's got to like stop, and then it starts going back to its starting point. So it's like it turns around on the line, and then starts going back to where it started, which is here. So from here to here, it moved away, but then it starts coming back. And from this point thereafter, okay, it's like, well, turns around again and starts going back in this direction here. So like, this is what I'm thinking about. It's all happening on one line, but I drew it this way so we can like think about the different pieces of this graph. Can we find a formula for the acceleration of this particle? And can we use this to figure out when the particle is speeding up and when the particle is also slowing down? Um, I think we can actually answer part of this without even using calculus. But first, let's get the acceleration formula. If you want the acceleration, you first need the velocity. So my first step is to take the derivative. And when I do that, I get 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And technically, this is the velocity function. 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. If you want the acceleration, okay, well, that means you take the derivative of the velocity, and that is the second derivative of our initial equation. 
So a of t is the derivative of this thing. The derivative is going to be 6t and then minus 12. And so we have every formula that we would need to start thinking about the answers to this question. And for starters, this is the formula for the acceleration. So let me box this off. Okay, so that's like step one. Step two is to think about where is this particle speeding up and where is it slowing down? Without using any calculus, I can intuitively think about where that must happen on my graph. So this particle is moving away. So it's moving away from the starting point, but it's like leveling off. So it's gotta slow down here because it must stop and then it turns around and then it starts speeding up again. But then, okay, it's you know coming back to this initial starting point here. So it means it's gotta slow down. And then after this point, it has to start speeding up again. The first thing I want to verify is, well, at this spot here and this spot here, which is this spot on my function and this spot on my function, the graph must, I mean, the, the particle must stop at these points on the graph. That must mean your velocity is equal to zero at t is equal to one and t is equal to three. You know, is that true? I think so. What I'm going to do just to verify this is take my velocity function, set it equal to zero, and see if I get these two solutions. So let's solve that. Does 3t squared minus 12t plus 9 equals zero at 1 and 3? Well, I'm noticing that I can divide both sides by 3. And my equation is t squared minus 4t plus 3 is 0. This thing factors. We get t minus 1 and t minus 3. OK, I see now. t equals 1 makes the first factor 0. And t equals 3 makes the second factor 0. So in terms of stopping, that's where your velocity must be 0. And I could figure that out by using this equation. But in terms of slowing down, where does that happen? Where does speeding up happen? Here's how we're going to reason this out. If both your velocity and your acceleration are positive numbers, that must mean your particle is increasing in speed. So I'm just going to say that for speeding up, it must be that both the velocity and the acceleration are positive. Now, if velocity and acceleration both take on a negative number, that means you're speeding up in this direction. So we're also going to include, well, if your velocity and acceleration are also both negative, that means you're speeding up as well. So in terms of slowing down, this happens when your velocity and your acceleration are opposite in sign. So either your velocity is positive and your acceleration is negative, or uh, the opposite. Your velocity is negative and your acceleration is positive. If these have opposing signs, that is what is causing your function or your particle to slow down. So to actually figure out where this happens, I went to Desmos and I graphed all three of these functions together. This was my graph s of t. Here in green, this is the velocity curve v of t. And then in orange, I'll just use red up here, this was my acceleration. So wherever my acceleration and my velocity are both positive or they are both negative, we are speeding up. All right, so let's check out where that happens by using these functions. So I'm only looking at the green and the orange one as a guide. OK, so for the acceleration, we'll start with the velocity. So from here to here, the velocity is positive. From here to here, the velocity is negative. And from here to here, the velocity is positive again. So like we're partitioning it like this. And in terms of the acceleration, okay, between 0 and 2, 
your acceleration is negative. So A is less than zero. But halfway in between here, it's also negative. And then over here, it's positive. So it's like we have four different areas to consider. Here, between zero and one second, so I'll say between zero and one seconds, the velocity and the acceleration are opposite in sign, so we're slowing down. This makes sense. Your particle is coming to a stop, so it's got to slow down. Now from here to here, Okay, so this is where your velocity and is negative and your acceleration is negative. So between one and two seconds, it's got to be that your particle is speeding up. And that makes sense. It slowed down, but then it starts speeding up again. Eventually it has to slow down again, but like first it's you know speeding up before it begins to slow down again. So from here to here, both the velocity and acceleration are negative, and so that means speeding up. It just means speeding up in the opposite direction. From here to here, again, your particle has to eventually come to a stop again. So the velocity is negative, but the acceleration is positive. So between two and three seconds, your particle is slowing down. And then from here to here, both the velocity and the acceleration are positive, and therefore your particle must be speeding up again. So in that last interval from three to four seconds, your particle is speeding up. So intuitively, it makes sense to me that if both your velocity and acceleration are positive, that your uh, particle is speeding up. These things are like working together to speed up the particle. But over here, if they're both negative, that isn't as intuitive. Uh, the negative on these things means, okay, we're moving back towards our starting point. But since they're both negative, it also means they're working together. And since these are working together, it's actually speeding up the particle, but the negative is indicating that we're moving back to where we started. So not as intuitive, but if they have the same sign, the same thing happens where they speed up. I think uh, one thing that I would like to change with the work that I've written out here is, I mean, technically, we have some overlap between the endpoints. So maybe instead of saying closed brackets, uh, maybe I'll use some open parentheses. It's not a huge deal, but uh, basically, if I include both one, where it's slowing up, uh, slowing down and speeding up is kind of an odd way to phrase it. So I'll just say it's slowing down and speeding up on these open intervals, but at one and at three, it's actually doing neither. It's just like at a dead stop. And then we won't really consider what is happening on the endpoints either. But that's it for this problem.